Uh, yeah, so as you said, I'm Alex. So this is based on some joint work with Sarah, who's also around. Um, and so as you can tell, we're going to talk about game theory and security models. Um, so there's been already a lot of work in, around game theory and security, um, whereas in the context of blockchains and cryptocurrencies, but also kind of around that, especially with distributed systems um, that have been going on for decades now. So one big takeaway that we have from reviewing, you know, over 100 papers to write the, the SOK that we wrote um, is that we're not there yet, but there are actually some useful tools out there. And a lot of them actually predate blockchains and cryptocurrencies, um, which is, you know, a, a good thing because it means there's things to draw on and also means that, you know, we shouldn't try and reinvent the wheel too much. Um, but also that there's some bad habits that, you know, are around in, in current research around cryptocurrencies. Um, and that's what I'm going to kind of talk about today with the example of, you know, a lot of people are proving things around the, you know, Nash equilibrium, which is obviously everyone's heard about it and it sounds marketable, um, but isn't actually very useful in practice, um, which is what we're going to see. So, you know, game series, a brief recap is, you know, you have a game and you have incentives and what is the best way to play the game? Um, this is what game series is about. There's some nice maths and you, you know, you can be happy because you get convincing results, you get nice equations. Uh, and everyone can go home satisfied that, you know, things are going to go exactly as they should. Um, because you have solution concepts like Nash Equilibrium, which more or less tells you that, you know, the game is being played the right way and no one else has an incentive to not play the game in that way. Um, and so, you know, you're done and everything is as it should be. There are other solution concepts. Uh, we're not going to get into those today because they're basically just refinements of the Nash Equilibrium for different con for different situations, um, but, you know, the, what I'm going to say will apply to them as well uh, to some extent. So it's, you know, if you're thinking about other solution concepts, don't be worried. They will still get something useful out of this. Um, and so an equilibrium, to remind everyone, is just a strategy profile, which means, you know, the actions of people in the game um, from which no one should deviate if, they are, if they're rational. Um, rational here is important. We'll get back to that in a bit, but essentially it means that you're trying to optimize your utility. Um, and, you know, Nicodemus means that no one is deviating. It doesn't mean that it's the best way to play for everyone. It might actually be not the best way to play for anyone in the game. Um, so a prisoner's dilemma is kind of a standard example of a, of a simple game where, you know, two prisoners are in different rooms and they have to choose whether they, you know, rat the other person out or not. Um, and there's an equilibrium, which is optimal for neither of them. And worse than that, actually in real life, in experimental studies, no one actually plays the equilibrium. So it's not, you know, not quite as good as you would want it to be. Um, and we'll get back to that a bit later. Mechanism design is very closely related to game theory. Um, you're, instead of starting with a game and deciding how you should play it, you instead decide you know, what you want as an outcome and try and design a game around that, and especially try and design uh, the incentives that will make sure that people, that are rational, um, do as you think that they should do. Um, kind of the canonical example for this is auctions, um, double-priced auctions and things like that, to incentivize people to, you know, bid what they think is the correct price rather than, you know, playing games around, like, underbidding and overbidding. Um, and there's been, obviously, like, cryptocurrencies with, you know, mining. Behind that is some mechanism design, which is meant to incentivize, you know, miners, to be honest, so that we can get, you know, the... The, the godly ratio of a majority of honest miners and everyone can go to the moon and be happy. Um, but that's hard to do in practice. So one, one kind of useful anecdote there, which is, you know, shows how hard it can be is the Israeli nursery study. Um, so this was an actual study that they did in Israel where at a nursery they observed that a lot of parents were coming late, um, which wasn't very satisfactory for the nursery. So they figured out that they would, you know, put a fine to parents becoming, coming late and that should incentivize them to come on time and pick up their kids. Um, sadly enough, what happened instead was that the parents, you know, sort of defined as a way to pay for extra childcare and started coming even later. And worse than that, when they took off the fine, the parents were used to coming in later, so they carried on coming even later. So really, they just made everything worse. Um, so why are we trying to mix kind of game theory with security? Um, you know, we've got some security notions from cryptography and distributed systems that are, you know, supposed to avoid bad things from happening. This is why we have papers and long proofs and, you know, we audit the code. Um, game theory and mechanism design, on your hand, are more about trying to promote good outcomes rather than avoiding bad things from happening. So that's maybe something that we want, and in particular for cryptocurrencies, there's an inherent, you know, incentives are inherently in the design. And 
you would like to take advantage of that and you know, make use of them to maybe either be more efficient in your constructions um, and not overloading yourself with like heavyweight crypto and distributed systems algorithms, um, but also because you know, at the end of the day, at some point, uh, you know, the users or the miners have choice over what they do. And what matters then is just you know, the incentives that they have to do things the right way. Um, and we've seen a lot of examples of failures from you know, when people build protocols and then they think about the incentives separately. Um, so either in banking, um, you know, people build technical protocols for payments so they didn't think about the incentives uh, in terms of whether the you know, card manufacturers would you know, build cards that actually um, could work well or whether the payment machine manufacturers would build payment machines that actually like to check the pin instead of building cheaper machines that didn't. Um, and this is, these are things that actually happened because people didn't think about the incentives for everyone in the system you know, until after they built the protocol and then they had to kind of retrofit the protocol to what people were actually doing and it became a gigantic mess. Um, surely a lot of people here don't have to be convinced that banking is you know, not going well these days. Um, so why is it hard to then combine game theory with security? Um, first, you've got the problem of you, know, you require more knowledge. Um, this is hard because you already need a lot of expertise if you want to build you know, cryptographic protocols or distributed systems. And now on top of that, you need to either learn a lot of game theory or find someone that knows it and pay them a lot of money. Um, when, you actually, when you actually get to work, you now have increased complexity, especially if you're trying to merge things in a kind of sensible manner. Um, you, know, you can't do standard proofs anymore because you need to take into account other factors, and that can add a lot of work and complication. Um, and that's because you have different assumptions depending on the fields that you're trying to merge. Uh, that's the biggest problem, and you know, we'll talk a bit about that now. So in cryptography, you've got an adversary, and you, know, you don't want to think about what strategy they might try to use to break your system. You only want to make sure that you know, within some reasonable computational um, capabilities, they only have a negligible chance of success of actually breaking um, your system. This read systems is you know, similar. You don't really think about how a node can fail, you just think nodes can fail, and so you would like to tolerate the number of them failing. Um, that, uh, you know, the ideal ratio there seems to be about one third um, for kind of, you know, Byzantine fault tolerance. And then you have other things like Bitcoin claims to be 50%, you know, I don't know whether it is, really is or not, but at least there's a claim. Um, and then game theory, on the other hand, you're concerned with rational players that want to maximize their utility, which is essentially maximize the money they make, for example. And so you've got security, which is you know, between inverted commas because it's not really security, um, means that the rational thing to do is the right one, which again is an inverted commas because the right one depends from your point of view. Um, and we'll, you know, again, we'll talk about rationality a bit later on in the talk, and you'll see that it's, this is where things start to break down. Um, so you know, getting back to you know, Nash equilibria, that a lot of people are proving, they're saying, you know, I've got this consensus algorithm, and you know, it's a Nash equilibrium to be honest, and mining will go well, and we'll avoid a lot of, a lot of issues. Um, because we've had issues already. Um, with Bitcoin, you have a lot of you know, big selfish mining. There's a lot of attacks out there that actually show that what you think is actually good for a miner to do is actually maybe not the ideal thing for them to do. Um, from a point of view of maximizing their utility. Um, and the key, another key thing here is that you know, no player should be able to gain anything from you know, a unilateral change in strategy, which means that they're the only one deviating. Um, but you know, even with Bitcoin, you've got at least you know, like three to five miners on a good day. That's more than one. So more than one could deviate, and a lot of them go to the pub together, so they could easily decide to deviate together and collude. That's an issue. Um, you also have, you know, you never know, maybe they might be irrational from at least your point of view or responding to, you know, external incentives. incentives. Um, they can fail arbitrarily. I think a few weeks ago there was a big drop in the hash rate um, because, I don't know, maybe a miner lost, you know, their, their electricity got shut down. You know, if there's any miners in California right now, we might see that happen. Um, and also because computing a Nash equilibrium is actually a computationally hard problem. So if it's hard to compute the Nash equilibrium, you know, for one, how are you going to know what you're meant to play? Um, and second, like how are you going to know that other people have actually gone through the trouble of figuring out how they should play according to the equilibrium, assuming that you know, other people are playing the equilibrium? Um, this is a mess. And part of this, part of why, is because information matters, right? When you, ideally, you have complete information, which means that you know who the other players in the game are, you know what their actions are, you know what their utilities are, um, and you go from there. 
That's the context in which a Nash equilibrium is defined. Um, but in practice, you can have incomplete information, which means that you're missing information about the game, so you don't know what the player types are, you don't know what their utilities are, um, or you've got imperfect information, which means that you, know, you only have a probability distribution that you know, represents a belief in, let's say, what's happened in the game. So if you're at some stage of a game, you might think, well, maybe this has happened, maybe that has happened with some probability, and then you have to pick and choose based on that. Um, you know, and that's pretty much how real life is in practice. Um, you really actually have complete information, and certainly not in something like, you know, cryptocurrencies at a very large scale. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of potential players. Um, maybe they're anonymous. You know, there's networking effects to take into account. Um, it's just hard. And so, you know, can you even know if other people are playing the Ethereum strategy? Not really. So, from that point of view, you know, you have you need to have the belief that they're actually doing it to motivate yourself to play it. Otherwise, some other strategy might be better. Um, is the equilibrium strategy even common, uh, common knowledge? If they don't know that, it's, that everyone else is playing it, because that's the requirement of common knowledge, that not only you should know what it is, but that everyone should know, and everyone should know that everyone knows. Um, that's a much tougher requirement to guarantee when you might not even know who the other people are. Um, and miners exist you know, outside of the cryptocurrency. They're not some, some abstract concept. They actually have you know, mining farms somewhere. They have to pay electricity bills. Um, there might be other incentives. Maybe someone is, you know, motivating them to move their, their, their farm somewhere that has cheaper electricity. Maybe on the hand, their electricity costs are going to go up. Maybe they live, you know, the government is putting pressure onto them because they want to regulate what they're doing. And that can influence, you know, actually their behavior. Um, and even, you know, worse than that, they might actually benefit from a cryptocurrency just crashing down, um, which was the idea behind Goldfinger attacks that, you know, were presented a couple years ago. And, you know, this really highlights one thing, which is that not only do you not necessarily know the incentives that might come from outside the system, but even within the system, the incentives can change. Um, bribery attacks are a great example of this, which is that you can actually change what the incentives within the system. You might even be able to do it in a verifiable way. Um, you know, we had the, the case of with Ethereum, you could easily build smart contracts that, you know, would actually support verifiable bribery attacks so that you know, a miner didn't have to trust that the briber would pay out, they would just get paid. Um, and worse than that, Ethereum actually subsidized the briber. Um, this was some research that was done about two years ago that I did with um, Patrick McCory, which a few of you might know. Um, and we actually showed it was completely profitable to do a 51% on Ethereum, which really was a 25% once you took into account that you could bribe miners instead. Um, so, you know, if you can't even guarantee that the incentives within your own system are not going to change, it's very hard to actually prove sensible things. And so then, what's rational? Um, you know, again, rational is about maximizing your utility. But you know, we've shown that you can't really know what the incentives of everyone in the system are. And the information that you have is probably not very accurate. So even if you're you know, estimating some probability distribution, you don't know, you know, it might be very far from the reality. And that makes it hard to define what actually, what actually is a rational player um, or a rational miner because they, from, you know, they might essentially belong to a system which is different than yours and have completely different incentives. And so even if you think the net are being rational um, and you're building some protocol to tolerate that kind of irrational behavior they're exhibiting, maybe you know, from their reference point, they're actually being completely rational. I think Brian Ford and you know, Raynan Baum kind of did a blog post and a short paper about this the other day where they go through 10 pages of a fairly complicated argument that is essentially this. Um, that, you know, within a system might be part of a bigger system that introduced new incentives, and so you can't really, you know, being irrational might be rational with reference to that larger system. Um, so what can you do to try and, you know, alleviate these problems, which is, you know, hopefully what everyone that is building something is trying to do? Um, you need to account for different behaviors and kind of relax, you know, your, your assumptions about what's rational or irrational, and take into account that some people might even be altruistic. Um, we know a lot of systems, you know, like torrenting or even Tor, that you know, pretty much exist because some people do, are altruistic. So maybe, you know, what, what can you expect from that? Um, you know, taking into account that you know, play, miners and uh, users don't live in isolation. They communicate with others. Uh, they can collude. They can you know, deviate arbitrarily for you know, random things. Maybe the electricity goes down. Maybe they're just being you know, genuinely irrational. Um, and you know, if, you're, if you've got some security model, you need to define a threat model. 
and an adversary that has some capabilities. Um, so can you make actually, you know, like good guesses about what strategies they might follow to, you know, try and make a more efficient and realistic construction rather than, you know, doing something that's actually more costly but protects you against things that aren't actually, you know, practical or realistic to do. Um, and that requires an understanding of how to combine security assumptions um, that you have from cryptography and distributed systems with, you know, assumptions you have in, in game theory um, in kind of, you know, putting, putting both together into one coherent model rather than treating both separately. So we've got some, there's some research that already exists. As I said, we reviewed, you know, well over 100 papers um, in the process of writing a, an SOK paper about this. And so I'm going to, you know, quickly kind of introduce some, some interesting ones and then we'll, we'll kind of conclude based on that. Um, so the first thing is, you know, looking at tolerating, you know, colluding players or more, more than one player uh, deviating. So there's, you know, um, KT robustness, which came, came about uh, at this point more, well over a decade ago. Um, they looked into, this was kind of in the original game theory for distributed systems research long before cryptocurrencies, um, where they looked at just, you know, refining what you think of a Nash equilibrium into saying that, you know, it's KT robust if it tolerates up to K colluding players and T players that deviate. Um, or similarly, maybe you want to, you think that, you know, players can be risk averse. You know, Daniel Kahneman got a Nobel Prize for showing the people risk averse. Um, where, you know, if you've got, a, you've got a strategy to punish players um, that might deviate, then, you know, you can maybe you can tolerate K colluding players. And, you know, if you've got T players enforcing the punishment strategy, that's okay. Um, so, you know, look at, proving your, look at proving things like this into your systems rather than just looking at one, one player deviating. Um, another one is the bar model, where, you know, bar is for Byzantine, altruistic, and rational, which are, you know, the three types of players you might expect. And instead of thinking, you know, we've got a third of, you know, Byzantine players and then, like, the other ones are all rational, maybe some of them are altruistic, um, you know, think about you know, the ratios of altruistic and rational players that you expect, and you, as well as ratio of Byzantine um, players that you expect, and think about, you know, how you define what's rational um, and what's altruistic in your system. And from there, you have something like incentive-compatible Byzantine fault-tolerant system, um, which then means that, it's, you know, it's, you, you have a bar-tolerant system, um, and which is optimal for rational players. You know, there's no point in proving an equilibrium if it's not actually that good for rational players because then, you know, they might try and they'll, they'll probably deviate anyway. Um, and then, you know, another one more on the cryptography side is, you know, related to doing crypto and taking into account that, you know, an adversary might have limitations that aren't only related to their computational capabilities. Um, so you can think of a game between the design of a protocol and an adversary where, you know, intuitively, if you break a protocol, clearly you're getting something out of it that you would never try. Um, basic cryptography essentially says that, you know, you've got an insane utility and so you'll try to break it at all costs. Um, but that rarely matters, right? If you're, if you're a, real, a real entity and you have a risk of getting caught, you're not going to actually try and, you know, break a protocol if you think the risk of getting caught is too high. Um, so things like detection maybe, you know, can allow you to build more efficient protocols instead of, you know, going really heavy on the crypto and getting something that doesn't scale very well. Um, and another approach, instead of going from cryptography and then trying to add in some, you know, game theory concerns, um, maybe you start from game theory. You can do things like Bayesian machine games. Um, Raphael Pass is one of the people behind that. Um, if he speaks tomorrow, I don't know if he actually is going to. Um, and then, you know, you, you start from a game, but instead of players, you have Turing machines that have, you know, some fixed computational capability, and you find games between them, and then you actually get a link from, you know, the idea of a game theoretic implementation, which is related to, you know, mechanism design and, you know, implementing a, a game that actually, like, you know, fills this notion of incentivizing the right thing to be done. Um, you get a link between that and secure computation, which is obviously kind of, you know, the gold standard that you want in cryptography. Um, so in conclusion, you know, be careful about what you're proving. All models are wrong, some are useful. Um, you know, you're much better off getting an approximation to something good than something exact, which is actually not very useful. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. A lot of people have been doing research around game theory and especially distributed systems for years. Um, you know, read that, look it up. Um, don't try and, you know, just read an introduction to game theory and start from there. You'll reinvent a lot of things that you don't need to waste your time doing. 
Um, and there's many kind of, you know, things to build on that are already out there. So, you, it's, you know, a lot of low-hanging fruits and maybe some low-effort contributions that you can make. The paper goes over, you know, a lot more. Um, hopefully this is giving you a taste of what we discussed in the paper. There's a lot more technical details um, and things that you look into. So hopefully you're, you know, you'll be incentivized to do that now. And uh, that's the end of my talk. So I don't know if maybe there's time for a quick question. Um, otherwise, the paper is online and you can contact me or Sarah. Um, our Twitter is blocked by these cute little birds. Um, but you should be able to find us based on our names.